All right, guys, today we are going to be talking about a video that I think is important, especially to mention on this channel, and especially because we talk a lot about survival knives, but when it boils down to it, like a lot of my videos are focused on this survival knife, that survival knife, this survival tool, that survival tool, you know, having different um, pieces of gear, things I haven't regretted owning. But I think a video like this is really important because this is the why to why we choose certain survival knives that we do or why we don't choose other specific survival tools. And especially being in winter more than anything, I think that it's very important when you're dealing with inclement weather or when exposure risks are higher that you understand what the key ingredients to survival are, like how to survive the first 24 to 72 hours. Because as I've talked about a lot in this channel, when it comes to search and rescue priorities, like the people who are actually gonna be looking for you in a real survival situation. And when we really boil down like wilderness survival, a lot of people get this kind of mixed up or misconstrued notion or idea or sense that, you know, like wilderness survival is going out into the woods and living forever. Like no, truly survival is about how, or wilderness survival at its core is about how we can affect maintaining our life, like staying alive, staying, you know, breathing and, you know, not freezing to death or not, you know, overheating, you know, not dying. So functionally staying alive for the first realistic 72 hours. In addition to this as well, um, you know, other huge focuses here are on, you know, how we can affect our survival or how we can signal for help. That's why in a lot, in a majority of my genuine survival videos, like when we're actually talking about real survival skills, I talk about things like personal locator beacons, GPSs, because a lot of people, uh, they like to be very boisterous in the YouTube comment sections and they're like, oh, you know, I would never need a PLB. And it's like, well, if you're an actual survivalist, like the whole point is to get rescued because if you're just living in the woods forever, that's totally cool. Like, you can do that. It, there's not an issue. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, uh, you know, want to live in the wilderness forever. I'm just saying if we're having a real like person to person or frank conversation about survival, it's the core is being rescued, right? Like, so, you know, you'd be silly to not try to bring as many, especially small and realistically, you know, man portable pieces of equipment that could affect your survival as possible, right? So having things, having redundancies, like I said, having GPS, having PLBs, having the ability to uh, signal for your rescue just makes tons of sense. Now, um, when it comes to realistic survival priorities, especially in the Northern Hemisphere and especially in the winter more than any time, but realistically, you know, um, in the Northern Hemisphere as far as it goes, there's really two key points to survival. And these are the points that like everything is structured around. Once again, I make videos about like this new survival knife, or, you know, I sit here and I'm like the best wintertime survival knife or the best bang for your buck is the Cold Steel SRK in CPM 3V, right? This is one of the knives that I sit here and I talk about very frequently. And I talk about this knife a lot because it's very effective, but honestly, once again, what is effective? And so the two biggest and key points, I would say, whenever you go out to practice wilderness survival, you find yourself in a survival situation. And honestly, um, like the biggest things that we should really be concentrating on, like I said, especially when it comes to practicing wilderness survival are firecraft and sheltercraft. When it comes down to it, the biggest risk I think a lot of people tend to over uh, look, especially in the winter, is exposure. When it comes down to it, it's, it can get very cold very quickly. And realistically, you have to maintain a pretty high body heat. So in survival, the biggest priorities and what we have to center our pieces of equipment around are how good are they at one, building shelters, and two, how good are they at starting fires? And when I say starting fires, this is kind of one of those weird sentiments because starting a fire is a multi-phased plan. And this is, once again, something that, you know, it gets misconstrued a lot because I talk uh, at nauseum about batoning and why you should do it because it's a dying practice. And a lot of people honestly sit there and they're like, oh, it's just for YouTube. It's just a fake thing or it's something that, you know, dumb YouTube survivalists do. But realistically, like firecraft is a kind of a circular, um, 
I don't, I don't quite know the best analogy for it, but it's a multi-phased plan. It's like a whole circle of different phases, right? You do have the actual ignition and the actual fire part of it. And there's a part of sustenance, right? Like if a fire, you can't just start it and it just goes forever, right? There's a part of sustaining it. And of course, any type of fire, whether it's isobutane or wood, of course, it's only as finite or it's only as infinite as its materials, right? So you have to keep adding wood if you want a wood fire, you have to keep adding isobutane if you want that type of propane style fire or, you know, alternative fuel fire, you have to have that fuel source, right? But in addition to this, especially when it comes to wood-based fires, which is realistically what most survival fires are going to be, what most fires that you're gonna be gleaning heat from, and that's the huge reason as to why we start fires, is that you know we're trying to keep our own bodies warm enough so that they don't die um, from exposure is that there's processing right you have to take down trees you have to be able to drop trees with either a knife a saw or a hatchet or axe you know some kind of instrument or tool has to be able to drop those pieces of wood and then or trees not pieces of wood fell the trees and then of course once you get those trees on the ground you have to buck them into small manageable pieces of wood and then of course you have to process those pieces of wood into smaller realistically burnable pieces of wood because it doesn't take a dummy i think most people intuitively know you can't just throw a log on a fire and it just you know burns you know you unless you have a very well established fire with a well established coal base you can't just chuck a log on it. So you, know, you have to start from the ground up, very small pieces of wood and feather sticking and build your way up, right? So when we look at something like a cold steel SRK, the reason why we sit here and say like, this is a really good knife for wilderness survival is because not only does this have the capacity to do those larger tasks such as batoning, but this can cover a full realm of the important and necessary attributes and aspects of fire starting as a whole, right? Firecraft isn't just out mind as one singular thing of like, hey, start a fire. It's how can we buck trees effectively? How can we fell trees effectively? How can we process wood effectively? And then also two, the other thing that's very important and the reason why I love the book Bushcraft for those who don't own it, like if you are seriously into wilderness survival and wilderness living as a whole, you really do owe it to yourself, at least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, to own that book is because even if you don't necessarily have the trees that are listed in that book, it also goes over like how you should conduct research. In the book Bushcraft, we have... Um, or um, Morris Kohansky goes over how many BTUs or British thermal units are in a cord of birch wood, in a cord of spruce, in a cord of aspen, in a cord of in multiple different other woods, right? And so in your areas, you should be prioritizing and knowing what kind of BTUs you can expect out of the different local woods that you will be utilizing. And this, this is one thing that sounds very silly, but honestly, you'd be surprised. There is a leap, and I cannot remember the numbers off the top of my head, but there is a genuine leap between burning aspen as a wood, which is a pretty common wood around my uh, neck of the woods, uh, all puns intended, but um, also burning birch. Birch has a substantially higher BTU per cord. And when we talk about cord, you can sit there and say like, well, I'm not going to burn a cord of wood. And you might not, you actually might in a survival situation, but either way, whether it's one piece of wood or a whole cord, it has a higher BTU output than a, a piece of aspen, right? So if we're out in the woods and we can identify a, you know, standing dead birch over a standing dead aspen, the survival priorities here are let's take the birch down, let's process the birch because either way, you're realistically looking at about the same amount of caloric um, output to process, you know, to buck a tree to uh, or sorry, to fell a tree, buck a tree, and then, you know, process it down into kindling and start that fire, as opposed to, um, you know, like if you get a greater yield out of your birch tree. And when something has greater BTUs, it means that not only is it going to produce more heat, but it's also more than likely going to produce a better coal base. And what that means is your fires are going to last longer. So once again, if say it takes you 100 calories, which it will definitely take you more, but it say it takes you 100 calories to fell, buck, and process a tree, right? And that tree produces we'll just say 10,000 BTUs over, you know, it takes you 100 or of birch, I should say. And then it takes you, you know, the same 100 calories to process a 
tree, that's an aspen, and it only produces 6,000 BTUs, you can see that there is a noticeable difference between those two um, in what you get, like an ROI, so to speak, return on investment. And so I think it's important when it look to, you know, when we focus on survival, it's not just about like the survival instruments or tools, or whatever you want to call these guys, you know, the knives, the saws, the axes, the hatchets. Um, it's not just about these tools, but also fully understanding what you do and that your actions have consequences and how to optimize your actions. And so, when it comes down to these priorities, it's not just how can I be the fastest around, but also how can I make the wisest and smartest decisions when I'm out there. And so this is why I like the book Bushcraft, kind of going back to that original point that I made, is that it not just shows you and teaches you things like these are the different BTUs of birch versus aspen, but if you're in an area where say you have hickory wood, you have oak, you have other you know, trees, you know, research these things, understand what is the best BTU output of a, a wood in your woods? What should I be prioritizing? What are the strongest woods for shelter building? And once again, um, you know, if you're in a 72 hour situation, building a, a tree out of hickory, or sorry, building a shelter out of hickory might not be like the smartest choice, but genuinely Genuinely, uh, like some seriousness to this is that if you are in a snowstorm, what is the snow load? What is the realistic snow load of your shelter, right? Is it going to collapse on you in the middle of the night? So we want to be smart about these choices in survival. And I think this is something that is easily overlooked. But what I mean, like being the best and the fastest at shelter building and fire building or firecraft and shelter craft, it doesn't mean just being quick and expedient and efficient. It also means being smart about the choices that we make and also having the deeper understanding of being able to look at two trees I you know kind of go back to that Nietzsche walk if you guys don't know what that is it's a funny kind of YouTube um, comedy on people who like to be outdoors and like to hike right but in in the very first kind of Nietzsche walk he's like you can tell this is an Aspen because of the way it is right like it being a real survivalist isn't just looking at a tree and be like oh yes that's an Aspen but understanding that you know this is an Aspen this is a birch this is an alder this is a willow this is a a, you know, white spruce is the black spruce. And I'm not saying you need to go and get, you know, a like biology degree to be a good survivalist, but genuinely understanding and doing the background research so that when you're out in the field or even when you're out in the field, truly learning the differences between what burns better, what, you know, produces um, better outcomes for your survival. And so this is part of why my channel exists is to help give this education, but also too, as part of my video or part of my channel's existence, is to make videos like this that give you guys tips from my experiences, my understanding, and my research. Like this is how I affect my survival training and how I teach other people in person to become better at survival or to just be more thoughtful when they're out in the woods. It's kind of goes back to that old um, coyote mindset that Dave Canterbury talked about many moons ago, I think probably over a decade ago, where when you're out in the wilderness, you're not just walking around saying, wow, it's a nice tree, you know, wow, this is such a lovely, you know, place we're strolling through. It's just, I love being out in the woods. Like that's certainly an aspect of it, but also being able to look around you and be like, well, I can use that for cover. I can use that for kindling. I can use that to affect my survival in this way or that way. So it's this type of ever presence within your mind that you're analyzing your situation and you're trying to you know, see the best possible routes of affecting your survival. That's what really separates a good survivalist and someone who's effective at survival from someone who's going to die. And so honestly, this is kind of my breakdown and explanation of the most effective and most important survival skills, which is once again, survival crap. <laughs> shelter craft and fire craft, but not just saying, here's how to start a fire really easily, but also know what you're starting your fires with, you know, know how to do it in an efficient way and know how to source the best materials in your area. And once again, you may be unfortunately in an area where there's only spruce. I've been in plenty of spruce stands where you're in a, you know, three square mile radius or a three square mile um, area and all there is is white and black spruce, right? There is no birch tree. So not every survival situation is created perfectly or equally. You may not have the opportunity to go to better woods and get you know, more effective equipment or more effective um, supplies, but at least know how to make the most of the supplies you have. Anyways, guys, this has been my TED Talk. <laughs> Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. As always, guys, God bless and I'm out.